Well, good evening, Tom. I'm very pleased to be interviewing you this evening again about your upcoming book, Primal Man, Primal Woman, A Discussion of the Significance of Gender. You recently did an interview with Evita O'Shell of Evolving Beings in Toronto, and she did a charming and informative interview with you, and some points were brought up from this book that are really going to be interesting, and I was wondering if you would be able to comment further. The theme of her interview was practical applications, and I'd like I'd like for you to, to go over that or expound on that and also to maybe elaborate on some of the theory that's involved and also as we always do we take it outside of this PMR or physical matter reality and question some of the things that might be going on there. So when do you think this book will be, will be available? <laughs> when? I don't know. I tell you I started the I started to write this by doing an outline, you know, some of the basic things I wanted to say. And that was probably five years ago. You know, for the last four or five years, I haven't done anything with it because I've been just too busy and haven't had the time. But, you know, the way I look at it, Colonel Sanders didn't start the chicken business until he retired at 65, so. Absolutely. <laughs> you know. I'm not, I guess, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel that pushed, but yes, it will be an interesting book. Um, it's basically about if you, if you strip all of the cultural beliefs and our personal beliefs too, away from the male, female gender roles and relationships, if you take all the cultural nonsense away and just have what's primal, what's fundamental, how men and women relate and complement each other, then that would be an interesting book, I thought, for people to see. Now, why would I write that book? You know, I'm not a sexologist or an anthropologist, either one, or a psychologist, but I have the perspective of being outside of my culture, being outside, actually, of my species. So, that's, that's a different, uh, that's a it's kind of a different uh, perspective. It is your big picture view, as yes. you always you always come from that. So that will be interesting. Yeah. You research from you know many sources, and you test out your your own theories. I know you have the ability to research into history timelines. Did you do any of that to come to some of these conclusions? In other words, the way you are going to describe this primal man and primal woman. Was this the relationship at the beginning of time? Was this the way it was set up to be? No, I did do a little investigation that way to see how things had changed over time. But primarily, most of my data was just observing people. You know, just looking at people, being a good observer and seeing past the, seeing past the beliefs and the fears that drive most people, that what might lie underneath that. So it was that sort of thing. It's from observation and some looking at the historical context of how men and women related to each other in a time when the, when the social constraints and the uh, cultural beliefs were very different than they are now. So it was, it was both of those. But this little piece that I talked about with Evita, uh, she asked me about relationships. She was asking, her theme was, let's talk about some practical stuff from MBT, not the theory, but you know, how does this relate to your life? And one of her questions was, well, what about relationships? You know, how do men and women relate better and fix their relationships? And what does MBT say about relationships? Which is a fair question, because if MBT is a theory of everything, it needs to say something intelligent and meaningful and helpful about everything. So asking what does MBT say about relationships, though that might see like a, seem like a an unfair question, you know, MBT doesn't necessarily talk a whole lot about relationships, but there are um, consequences of MBT that do indeed affect and uh, define relationship. So I just laid out a, uh, a very practical little, guys, here's what you do, girls, here's, here's what you do, kind of a practical, no theory, 
just the practical, what do you do to improve relationship? How do you approach it? So that was what you know, I did with Evita. And it didn't, I, I, don't, I didn't actually have that in my outline of the male-female book that I was intending to write, but it is part and parcel of the same sort of thing. And it probably would have ended up there eventually anyway, although it didn't actually make the, the, uh, the outline. So, um, I, I think when uh, primal man and primal woman, we think of Adam and Eve's story that we've been told. Yeah. Can yeah. you tell me what the basis of that is? And well, the Adam and Eve story is basically a, a metaphor. You know, it's, it's symbology. And uh, that's not necessarily a connection to uh, what I was thinking. I called it primal man or primal male and primal female. Primal being... What is it like under the hood once you strip off the beliefs and the fears? Get rid of all the fear and belief that makes men and women kind of act the way they do in our culture. And what do you have left? How would they interact? What's the optimal way for interaction? How is what they're doing um, both is driven both by natural fact that they are male and female human beings and how much of it, how much of it is belief and fear based? So that's the, I thought this would be helpful to people. So, because it, if you tell people what their, what their natural state is, what their primal state is, they can relate to that because they'll say, oh yeah, that feels right. Once they see the difference between their natural state and the state that is the fear and, and ego and belief driven, that may help them then uh, move toward a less fear and belief driven state of being. And since relationship is the big thing on everybody's radar, relationship is the, I mean, that's the, that's the big thing that we spend most of our time struggling with, then I thought that would be a book that might be valuable to people if it helped them kind of see what was natural and what was an overlay. What was fear? What was ego? And what's just the way it is because we're, you know, we're this human animal and we have, uh, you know, different genders. So what, what part's primal and what part's not? I think it'd be very, very interesting and very helpful to people. And I guess what I was getting at with the sort of Adam and Eve comment was, and, and I think you, you might have answered that partially, the, the times that we're in are very complicated. The culture, the expectations, the, the complexity of our times make it a little bit difficult. Relationships that basic primal person is kind of clouded over with a lot of these beliefs right. and cultures and things. And I guess you are saying, you know, whether this relationship would work, would have worked better in simpler times. Maybe that's so. I don't know how, you know, how you have researched that, but it certainly is interesting for you to get back to that basic, what is the basic reason for gender? Uh, what, what purpose does that serve? And I think your solution and your recommendations for men and women are very interesting. And when you say theory, what is the theory behind it? What, what kind of theory would you apply to well, that? Well, as far as the, um, the discussion I had with Evita, um, the theory is basically that a relationship works best if based on love. That's really the whole premise. That's all you have to understand. The problem is, of course, is that most relationships are not based on love. Now, there's all kinds of relationships. There's, re there's relationships you know, with your boss and with your neighbors, and you know, relationship covers a whole lot of things. But all of those relationships will be better if they're based on love. Now, I was particularly with Evita talking about the male-female romantic or you know, male-female pairing relationship. Okay, so that was, the, that was a relationship. And unfortunately, most of those relationships are not based on love. They have some love in them, but they're mostly based on needs. We don't fall in love as much as we fall in need. 
<laughs> Max, would you like to join the conversation? <clears throat> what do you have to say, Max? That was a very interesting comment you made I, there. I would imagine a lot, he would say. <laughs> <laughs> he says all his needs are primal. He, he doesn't have to worry. By the way, this is officially Sir Maximus the Catamus. Yes, it's Sir Maximus the Catamus. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's the, that's the problem in our society and in our culture people tend to feel in to fall in need with each other that means that people uh, you know do their mating dance uh, they they connect with other people of the opposite sex with the idea of having a relationship because that's one of the things that is that is primal to us this relationship but they do it from the prospect of fear ego expectations and beliefs that's what drives their entire life so it's not surprising that it also drives their mating behavior it also drives their relationship uh, focus because that's what drives them period that's the way it is i'm talking about average people you know most people and that most is probably like 99.99 percent you know that i'm talking about that fat part under the curve we tend to approach our life through fear, ego, expectations, and beliefs. So what happens is, because of that, we fall in need. We find somebody who will meet our needs, who will do what we want, who will give us what we want out of a relationship, whether what we want is you know, children, or somebody to clean the house, or somebody to take care of us, or somebody to bring home the bacon and earn the money, or somebody to fix the car, or whatever is in your, <coughs> your mind about what it is you expect and want out of a relationship, two people get together. They decide that they can meet each other's needs, and it would be a good relationship to do that. Well, a meeting of needs is basically a contract. It's a contract mentality. I'll meet your needs if you meet my needs. You see, that's how we go into these relationships. I'll do this if you do that. And here are the things you're not allowed to do, and here are the things you must do, and then here's the area in between where you can kind of do it as, as you will. That being the nature of most relationships, most relationships have problems. I mean, we have a divorce rate of over 50%, 60%, 70% or something, and uh, that's because a needs-based relationship is a contract. You satisfy mine, I'll satisfy yours. If you don't satisfy mine, then I start complaining. And I feel less and less like satisfying yours. You see, so eventually, a needs-based contract, like any contract, like most contracts, tend to eventually uh, go bad, isn't the right word, but they, they, uh, they get challenged, you know, as time goes on. Because things change, people change. The old agreements don't really work anymore. You know, they were made when we were in our early 20s with different sets of needs and abilities and things we brought to the table. Different fears, different expectations. And now at 30 or 40, everything's different. So the old needs-based contract doesn't really work so well anymore. So marriages and relationships, and this, you know, this is not necessarily just, you know, male-female relationships. In same-sex relationships, where you have two men or two women, basically they work the same way because in those relationships, it's more typical that one will take kind of the female role and one will take the male role. You know, they, so even in same-sex relationships, you break out into the same kind of gender roles typically that we find in the heterosexual world. So the same thing kind of applies for all relationships. It's not, uh, not that I'm leaving the, uh, the uh, same-sex relationships out. It all is the same application. So here we are, we've got these need-based relationships. They are contracts. They don't last a long time. And what do we do to try to fix them? Well, we go to a counselor and what the counselor does is try to renegotiate the contract. You see, trying to renegotiate and said, well, you know, sir, you need to pick up your dirty socks. You need to help with the, you know, help with the, uh, help with the dishes, you know, clean the house, you know, every other week. And you need to do this. And ma'am, what you need to do is, and you know, 
it's basically a renegotiation of the needs contract. Well, that doesn't work. It may work for a few months if they get kind of pumped up over, yeah, that'll be a lot better. We'll get what we need. But it always degenerates back to the same old thing in time. Why? Because it's a contract. Now, what is the solution to this problem? The solution to the problem is that the relationship to be a really good, you know, sirens going off, you know, flashes in, you know, fireworks in the air, that kind of a relationship that's really a great relationship needs to be love-based, not needs-based. It needs to not be based on fear and not be based on belief and expectation. It needs to be love-based. So, basically, what Avita was asking me, what, do we, what about relationships? You know, how can we fix our broken relationships? What does MBT say about fixing our broken relationships? Well, how do we need to interact with each other? And I had uh, considered this question uh, personally, my own relationships, as well as suggested it to probably a half a dozen other people. And when they applied the concept, it works. It just works really, really well. The way it works is that in order to change a needs-based contract to a love-based relationship, which is the only thing that can really make a relationship super, you know, a really good relationship, there is a way to do that that has the highest probability of success. And if you do it other ways, it still might work, but it's not nearly as likely to work. And what I've done is I've taken the fundamental nature of men and women and given them each roles toward this process of making the relationship love-based that are in consonance with their, with their gender, with the nature of being male or female. And if you like, we'll just go over, you know, what are the steps? I think that would be wonderful. Everything evolved. Was gender part of this evolution or did it exist in every living being from the beginning? Yes, gender is a part of our of our, our the consequences, the logical consequence of our rule set. The way I rule the way our rule set worked ended up in creating a situation where biological evolution could take place. And that process of biological evolution uh, started off of course with single cells splitting to make multi-celled things and multi-celled things splitting further to make uh, cells that were uh, specialized and differentiated with different functions and so on. And the key there, the key uh, pressure or criteria of evolution was two things. One, survival. The other, procreation. So in a biological frame, there's two things you need to do or you're going to become extinct. If you're going to survive, you need to survive, obviously, and you need to procreate because in biological systems, you don't... Uh, survive forever. So if you don't procreate, then, you know, you're gone as a species. And so sexuality and procreation was a fundamental part of the rule set of just how it works. So it is a very fundamental thing. It's not uh, an overlay or something that was dropped on us or a, a kind of a design uh, patch later on. It's, it's innate part of the rule set and how we evolve in this virtual physical reality okay so uh, that's the the you know the sexual aspects and the and the gender roles evolved because that was a successful way of handling the procreation problem and they could have evolved other ways you see you know each uh, you know an individual like a plant like some plants could be asexual or like some some um I don't know whether maybe it's viruses, I guess, or asexual, some other things, some other kind of living things are asexual, which means, you know, you sprout a bud and that bud then becomes another whole plant. So you can procreate in an asexual way. But that had its limitations in this, in this, um, you know, set of, of what uh, external environment that we had that, that uh, produced the, the pressure to procreate those kinds of solutions didn't work well, except in very limited cases. The solution that worked well was a sexual solution, and you ended up with male and female. Then roles developed around those that were survivable, that were, you know, that worked. 
So it was just evolution created our sexual roles the way they are because the ones that got tried that weren't the way they are now didn't survive. How do we know that? Well, they're not around. How do we know they ever existed? Well, the way evolution works is it tries everything. It's called mutation. Just the, it, mutations happen. Things happen. Different entities tend to have different bents and do different things. And the ones that are aiding the survival and the procreation keep going. The ones that aren't very good at the survival or procreation die out. So you end up with the winners. So our sexual roles are a natural part of our evolution, which is driven by our rule set, which created our environment, which created a source for our biology, and the rest of it is just you know, the way it is. So. Would you say that this is true? You know, our interviews always take go outside of this physical matter reality for some reason or other. That must be something because about... that's because we are a derivative reality. Our virtual yes. reality is dependent upon yes. the larger reality. So, so why do we do what we do, and how do we do it, and how does it work? Yeah. It almost always, if you understand it deeply enough, ends up in consciousness. It ends up in a non-physical reality that is the mother and father, if you will, of this virtual reality that we call physical. Our physical yeah. universe is a virtual reality. So. Because we're dependent and derived, it's not surprising we always end up with, yeah. you know, if we're trying to give a very fundamental explanation of how things are, we almost always end up starting with consciousness. And it always takes us to other reality frames, other other existences. There are many other reality frames, as you've mm -hmm. said before. Is this process similar? Are there processes of this sort of evolution and this continuation, this um, procreation, are there different types of, of uh, evolutions that way? Is the process similar? Do they have different rule sets? And can you give us an example? Sure. Yes, there are differences. Most of the other PMR like places that I've been do have, um, do seem to end up with a similar solution in their uh, evolutionary chain because it's still survival and procreation that is the, are the two, uh, uh, you know, the two driving forces. So they end up with often similar kinds of solutions because what works is what works. As long as their environment is a PMR kind of environment, kind of like ours with those kinds of, of tight uh, constraints, then they end up developing mostly similar kinds of solutions to those constraints. On the other hand, I've been places in other PMRs where I certainly could not tell the difference between males and females there, and I had no I have no idea actually how they reproduced or how they met the criteria of procreation. You know that wasn't clear to me, and I didn't get that personal I guess to you know to find out. So. I don't know, I guess would be the answer. Mostly where I, you know, places I have been that are other PMR-like places, it's similar to here. But there's some other places that I really don't know whether it's similar or not. It's hard to say how that solution was, was created. Now, in NPMR places, places that are not very tightly constrained, like in our dream reality and places like that, there is still procreation in those places. It's not sexual in the same way it is here at all. That's totally different because they are not driven by procreation and survival. Those aren't the issues that drive them. It's intentional. They can intentionally take a part of their own, what do we call it, uh, you know, of their own self, of their own uh, learning, you know, their own quality of consciousness, their own data, you know, think of people as, as information. They take their own information packet, if you will, that defines them, and they can start with that and make something that is not a duplicate of them, but something that um, has the potential to grow, but starts kind of where they start. It's all an intention thing. It's not a biological thing. It doesn't require two parents. It just requires one. It's more like the asexual budding sort of thing. 
And so that can be done in those reality frames and has been done in those reality frames. It's entirely different because the, the uh, forces that, you know, that, that drive things, that drive evolution, the constraints that drive evolution are totally different. So you get a totally different response in the NPMR than you do from the PMRs. So they interact with these other NPMR beings then that are their offspring, so to say, the same way that we would. And Sim it's similar, all about, yeah. actually, in all reality frames, there was, and it didn't start that way, but eventually it became a rule that those who would create offspring had to take care of them, look after them, and make sure that they got a good start. So that is a drive, if you will, that's just laid on us. That's kind of a rule. And for, for humans and for most of the people in, in PMR type, type uh, realities, that's just a, like a, an imperative, like a knowing, like a thing that you do. You know, uh, the mothers feel protective over their children. The fathers feel protective over their wives and their children. And that's just natural. That's not learned behavior. That happens in all species. You know, if you look at ducks or, you know, most any other species, there's very few that have, you know, that reproduce and have babies and, and then just fly off and leave them. Fish do. You know, fish don't necessarily, some fish anyway, take care of their young. You know, once the young are born, if they're born live or born from eggs, they're just on their own from the beginning. But mostly that's not the case. Certainly in all the mammals, that's not the case. It's really not the case even in, uh, in uh, some reptiles. So that, uh, that was a rule. So in, these, in the non-physical places, uh, when intent provides another being to evolve, those that create that being have to take some initiative to take care of it, to nurture it along to help it get started. Because it doesn't start, it's not just a person making a duplicate of themselves. They can't do that. I don't know, I say they can, I'm not sure why they can't do that, but I've never seen that. The, what they make tends to be something that is, a, that is a younger, less capable consciousness. Because what they're starting with, I think, is, is just the basics, kind of the raw definition of consciousness. They're not adding all their beliefs and fears and all that stuff that they have gained through their own experience doesn't go with it. Just the basic fundamental being without all the beliefs and fears is what starts. So then that being has to then gain experience. It's born with no experience. It has to begin by gaining experience. So they all then need to help that experience be positive experience that, that helps. Is that you know, an analogy of how we became individuated units of consciousness? Yes. We became individuated units of consciousness in NPMR first, and that was how it got started. There were no PMRs in the beginning. We were all just you know, individuated units of consciousness in NPMR. Then it became obvious that that was not a real efficient learning lab. It wasn't very efficient because there was no, there was no traction. There was no way to connect the feedback you got from your existence, from your choices, you know, with the choices. Each individual um, could easily turn on or turn off anything. So you didn't have real stickiness in the relationships. Everything was cerebral. Everything was uh, mental, if you will, and it became everything was intellectual. And when everything becomes intellectual, we know our intellects, you know, are as much a part of the problem as they are part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Our intellects get very easily confused with fear and with ego and with beliefs. And pretty soon we paint ourselves into a corner with these things. And we can't progress anymore because we, we uh, are no longer open because we've been around and we know everything and there isn't anything worth learning anymore because we know it all and then once you feel like that you can't learn it all even if what you know is only a tiny tiny fraction of what there is to know just that attitude shuts you off from knowing anything else so entities tend to get dead-ended their evolutionary process got very very slow 
So the need was, is, well, we need something better. This is not a very good evolutionary trainer. We need something that uh, once people get, get uh, you know, paint themselves into corners with their beliefs and ego, we need a way to erase that and let them start over again without those fears and beliefs, egos and expectations. That's why we have lifetimes, because that's a more efficient process to keep people from getting dead-ended. And, you know, we are like that. Look at most of the people who are, you know, even just over 40. I mean, 40 isn't all that old. That's somewhere in your middle part of your life. People over 40, and particularly people over 50, do tend to have that been there, done that attitude. They know almost everything that's important to know. There's not that much really that interests them as far as learning anymore. Now their job is just to instruct others and kind of sit back and, you know, go through life and turn the crank. They lose that excitement of learning that they had when they were two and three and four and 10 and 12. They were excited about learning and growing and becoming more. You hit 40 and, eh, you know, it's dull, no more excitement, not much more to learn, nothing, nowhere else to grow. Well, of course, that's foolish. There's much to learn, much to grow, but they kind of paint themselves into their corners with their beliefs, with their expectations, with their fears and their ego, and their, their uh, you know, their evolution, the evolution of their consciousness starts to dribble down to almost a halt. Well, that's why we have these lifetimes that end, so we can get back in the game, get excited again, start learning and growing from a, from a point where we're not dead-ended. That's one we talked yesterday about, I shouldn't say yesterday, we talked before about the efficiencies. That's one of the efficiencies of the process, of course. So we have these roles that we play mm -hmm. in PMR for learning. And now you're describing the roles, yet another role we have, and that is male and female. Mm -hmm. So this is another learning that, tool. The male and female emerged when we got into our virtual reality. See, we didn't really have the male and female before. We were just individuated units of consciousness. There was real no gender that went along with that. Once we produced virtual realities and rule sets that created stable virtual realities that we could use as virtual trainers for uh, growing low entropy consciousness, that's where the sexual roles developed as part of our rule set and our biology. Okay, so now when we're in this, when we're in these um, virtual realities, that's where you find sexual, sexuality. Sexuality becomes the, the solution to the procreation problem of a physical reality, you see. And that's where we get gender roles. So, yes, that's a whole new thing. Where we started in NPMR, we didn't really have gender. That wasn't an issue. Any individual could create another individual through intent. Now, I shouldn't say any individual. Only those that had enough understanding, enough enough uh, their own content, and enough focus, and that sort of stuff could do that. It's not like everything could, you know, could create new things. But some things developed enough where they could create new beings. And that process happened, and like I say, went on and on and on, but it turned out that it really wasn't a very effective learning process. So what happened? Evolution produced a more effective learning process called a virtual reality. So it, our virtual reality is sort of the fast track in evolution. We're here because we're on the fast track of learning how to grow up. You have said that always that love is the fundamental nature of, of our reality. It's what we're always striving for. It is what we are to become. It's in alignment with the nature of our reality. So it makes sense that relationships, as you are going to describe them in your book, is approached with love. This is your recommendation. It's always about the other. And the only thing that you may try to change is yourself. This is the basis of your prescription or your method 
it for is. improving relationships. Yes, it is. But that's because it's the basis of everything. You see, yeah. our whole reality works that way. Our reality is, is consciousness. Consciousness is a digital information system. And its environment, its uh, pressure, what it has to do to survive and keep going is reduce its entropy. Okay, so that's its thing. It doesn't have uh, procreate, you know, and survive. Procreation isn't isn't a you know isn't a driving force for a digital information system. They don't have to procreate a bunch of digital information systems. That's not it. It has an environmental pressure though to not dissolve into nothingness. You see, randomness is no information. If all the bits are random, there's no information. If there's no information, then the digital information system has no content. It's just potential. It no longer exists as an information system because there's no information, you see. So the digital information system needs to decrease its entropy in order to survive, in order to keep being an information system. So this larger consciousness system needs to lower its entropy. Now, how does an information system lower its entropy? Well, if your information lowering entropy means more content, taking random bits and ordering them, more structure, more, uh, more meaningful structure. You can make some structure that's just a meaningless structure, and that does lower entropy a little bit, but you get so much more lower entropy if the structure actually relates to something else. It becomes relationship. See, so just structure, and here's a structure, and there's a structure, you kind of run out of that. That's, a, that's your maybe first thing you try to do. Here's a bunch of ones and zeros. There's a bunch of ones and zeros and so on. But now you can lower your entropy much more if these various structures interrelate to each other some way. Now suddenly there's lots of different things that could happen. Consciousness, in, the order, in order to evolve, first ended up breaking itself into pieces. So there were these individuated units of consciousness that could interact with each other, that had free will. Once you give them free will, free will being designed within this digital information system uh, in terms of um, decision space. So you give each of them a certain amount of decision space that it can make choices from, and now see how they interact with each other. Okay, now it did that. And what it turned out to be and how reality turned out, how actually we should say how evolution found a path forward was that the most optimal entropy reduction that you could get by the relationship of these entities was a cooperative, helping, positive interaction between them. It was love. So now we define love as the optimal interaction between individu individuated units of consciousness, you see? Because if the opposite of love is fear, if you, have, if you have relationship based on fear, well, fear negates things like trust. You, know, you can't have trust if you have fear. If you fear that somebody else is gonna get you or do something to you, then you don't trust them. Fear is, it's all mine, you know. I, <clears throat> here's all, I'm gonna get as much as I can and keep it for myself because you're afraid that you may have to do without. So you want to keep getting more stuff so that you won't ever have to do without. So fear tends to push you into being self-focused, self-centered, non-trustful, greedy. You know, all those things are fear-based. Angry, uh, uh, violent, they all come up out of fear-based. Those are all the very least helpful for lowering entropy because fear tears apart. Fear, you know, is self-destructive. So in a fear-based relationship, somebody gets something and you don't have it, well, you want to take it away from them, you see, because you want it. Or you're afraid with their extra power, they may do something to you, so you want to get them before they get you. I'll drag you down to get your stuff, or I won't let you get ahead of me. So it's very sticky, you know, it's got a lot of friction in it. It does not optimize the relationships. It minimizes the it minimizes the ability of, of the relation of the relating entities to lower their entropy 
Now that gives us the, the point that relationship between individuated units of consciousness succeeds, is successful, lowers its, en lowers its entropy, evolves, exists, you know, and continues existing, survives if it becomes love, because that's optimal. Okay, now here we are. We're two people, you see, and we're in this physical matter reality learning lab. And what do we do? We have relationships. We interact with other people because that's the best way to challenge, you know, your, your growth is through relationships, how you interact in these relationships. And we know already from our understanding of the larger conscious system that the way that we can optimize our interactions with other people is by interacting with love, by being love in our interaction. So it's already clear from a big picture without even analyzing what goes on here, just looking at the big picture, knowing how reality works, that if we are going to, if we are going to optimize our relationship with each other, that relationship needs to be love-based. I need to be thinking, what can I do to help Donna, to help Donna succeed? Donna needs to be thinking, what can she do to help me succeed? Now we're cooperative with each other, trying to build each other up, trying to support each other. That will help build structure and lower entropy better than anything else that could be done. So now here we have males and females, a factor of our biology, a factor of our rule set, a factor that this is a virtual reality, and they relate to each other. This whole reality is about relationship, about individuated units interacting with each other. It's not about how you interact with the rocks or whether or not a storm blows you away. It's about your interaction with other sentient beings. And those could be dogs and cats and elephants and squirrels as well. But the interaction is more deep and richer in its potential to grow if it's with another human being. And that brings us to communication. Uh, that seems to be a very difficult thing for some. Can you tell us the types of ways that communication between genders can be better? Oh, well, sure. You know, uh, uh, from where we were, this will tie into just where we were about to go. Um, so we've gotten to the point where we see that relationships based on fear, based on a, a um, you know, based on a contract, a need-based contract is not optimal. I mean, now we've just done the theory, right? We're talking about, well, where's the theory in this? Well, the theory in this tells you that a relationship with another being based on a need-based contract is not optimal. It's very suboptimal. Matter of fact, it's so suboptimal that it just won't work. It'll end up in frustration and it'll break apart. It's just not a very viable thing. About the best you can get out of a contract-based relationship is that people abide by the contract and it's better than being alone. You know, you can be friends. The two people become good friends and kind of meet each other's needs however they do, kind of do their own thing in their own way, but are nice to each other and are polite to each other and they're kind of friends and they don't irritate or bother each other. You know, if I have a bad habit that annoys you, you just let it go. That sort of thing. And you don't like it, but you tolerate it. So two people who, who cheerfully tolerate each other is about as good as it can get in a need-based relationship. Well, that's not good at all compared to what a relationship can really be. A love-based relationship is so much more than that. It's not the just getting by kind of relationship, which is the very best you can get out of a negotiated needs-based contract kind of relationship because they deteriorate. They might seem good when you first make the contract, but inevitably they degenerate over time. Why? because they're not love-based. Your heart's not in it. It's not optimal. It's a, it's a fear-based thing that is high entropy. It just doesn't have what it takes to be a real great relationship if it's need-based. Not for very long. You know, again, temporarily it can be wow, but the wow doesn't last very long. It, it won't. You know, how many contracts have you had with people that were wow for very long. You know, you have a contract with, with what? You have a contract with, uh, 
your employees, maybe if you're an employer, and you may get some employee and you may say, wow, he's a great employee. But five years later, he's just another employee. You know, he's working along, turning his crank, doing what he's supposed to do. It's just the way it is. It, uh, it tends to work that way. And that's why people say that, well, you know, once you get married and once your relationship matures, it's just not the same anymore. You don't have that, that, you know, that sparkle in your eye. You don't have that enthusiasm that your relationship had. And then we say, well, yeah, but that just means our relationship is now more mature. We've just matured. We're not those kids we used to be. So we don't need all that humma humma and that sparkle in our eyes. We'll just get along. Let's try not to irritate each other too much and try to give each other, you know, what they need and fulfill our part of the bargain. And it'll be nice. It's a lot better than being alone. You see how people settle for that sort of a thing? Whereas a real relationship based on love isn't like that at all. It's wonderful. It's bliss. It's, it's reinforcing. It's supportive. It's, uh, it's as good as it gets, as good as relationship can be. It's better than that uh, kind of goo-goo-eyed, uh, you know, romantic thing at the beginning. It's much better than that because it's not just that you are finding somebody that might give you what you want. It's that you are somebody that is what they want. And they are somebody that's what you want. And you can be yourself entirely. And they can be themselves entirely. And all of that is perfect. It all works good. It's not like you... I don't know how to say it. It's... Uh, if you haven't been there and experienced it, you just can't imagine it. It's really, really good. So, how does one do this? It's kind of where we're, where we're going. We see that what we're doing is suboptimal. We see we're mainly in contract relationships that are need-based. Needs are fear-based and belief-based and expectation-based and ego-based. How do we get out of it? Well, you have to turn it from a need-based into a love-based relationship. The only way you can do that is somebody has to break the cycle. You see, you get this cycle in a needs-based, in a contract-based relationship, you get this cycle that says, I'm only gonna give you what you want if you give me what I want. Well, both people feel that way. You see, it gets to a point that it's hard to break that. It's hard to do anything other than that. That just kind of, that, re that contract defines both of you and defines your relationship. And how do you get out of that? How do you stop doing that? Well, here's the way to do it. And I might say in the beginning is that love doesn't require two. Love is done with just one. Love is given. Okay. So if you love someone, it's a matter of giving to them. Love is about what you can do for other, not what you can do for yourself. If your intent and your needs are about you, what you need and what you want and what you have to have and your requirements, it's not love. It's ego and fear and expectation. You expect other people to do these things the way you want them, in a way you want them. You don't expect them to go out and have affairs or do other kinds of things. You don't expect them to do this or do that. You expect them to be happy with the way it is. You expect them to clean your house and make your dinner. You expect them to bring home a paycheck and pay the bills. There's these roles that we get into with all these expectations and fears if the expectations aren't met. Well, the way you break that is somebody has to change. Somebody has to just start having a love-based relationship just takes one okay it doesn't take two and you can have actually a perfectly good relationship with just one if only one of the two people are giving and loving and give to the relationship that can still be a good relationship if the other isn't quite capable of going there you see everybody can't necessarily get there everybody doesn't have a big enough capacity to love we all have different capacities to love depending on the quality of our consciousness. And if your capacity to love is just a little teeny thing because your ego and your fear is so big that your ability to love is small, then you may not be able to have a relationship in which you are love-based because you just don't have that much capacity to be love-based. Now that's sad, but that's the state of the way things are with people here. But most people can 
have a relationship that's love-based. Most people, your average person, has enough capacity to love, to have a really good love-based relationship if they just knew how, if they could just get out of this, this trap that they're in. The way to get out of the trap is that the men have certain things they need to do, the women have certain things they need to do. And none of these things can be done by acting them. They have to be done by being them. They can't just act the role. It's like, well, I'm going to act this out and see what happens. It won't work. If you're acting it out and not doing it, it's not love. If it's, well, I'm going to try this thing and see if that actually works and I end up getting everything I want. Well, that's still about you. You know, you're not saying, well, I'm giving because I'm acting. Acting isn't giving. Acting is still about you. So you have to actually be these things. Well, what are they? What are the roles? First of all, I'll talk to the men. To the males in your relationship with your woman or if you're in a same-sex married you know the the, the male the um as <clears throat> you say the male gender component to the more female gender component guys if there is a if there is an argument or a disagreement between you and your woman if there's something that you just don't agree on something she wants you to paint her bedroom another color you know right now it's white she wants it to be mauve and that's what she wants and she's asked you and you go mm, i don't think so you know it really doesn't need to be painted the paint isn't dirty and mauve in my bedroom you know that's wrong if she asks something of you if she wants something if there's a disagreement then here's the result she's right you're wrong <laughs> period Whatever it is, it doesn't matter the reason. If it's just because that's what she feels like, that's good enough. And if it doesn't make any sense to you, that doesn't matter. Because she's your woman, you love her, you want her to have whatever she wants, you want to make her happy. That's your job, because it's about her, not about you. When you start thinking of, well, that doesn't make sense, the paint will cost her money. Besides, I'd rather go fishing or, you know, watch football on TV. Then that's about you and your needs. So if it's about her and her needs, of course, dear, whatever you like. Any color you want, anytime you want it. <laughs> if you want it, if, if it's your need and your want, I'll do it as best I can, any way I can. That's the way you approach it. That's approaching your woman with love. If there's an argument... Guys, you're wrong. She's right. And you, it's not that you're going to act that way. You have to be that way. You really have to have that attitude toward her that whatever she wants, you try to make her feel special. You make her feel like she is the most important thing in your world. And she has to be the most important thing in your world. Now, if you don't have that capacity, if you don't have that in you, if that's impossible for you to do because you're so much comprised of fear and ego and belief and expectation, then you just aren't able yet. You're not quite ready for a loving relationship. So now why do I, why do I say that the guys need to do this? That the woman is always right and the guy's always wrong and he has to do whatever it is she wants and needs. That seems very one-sided, right? And the ladies are all smiling because <laughs> yeah. they say, yeah, I'll go for that. They'll and like the men that. are all going, uh, I'm not so sure about this. <laughs> this doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Well, there's two reasons for it. One has to do with the male and one has to do with the female. The one that has to do with the male is that men can do this sort of thing. They have it in them. They can not only, you know, it's not that, they, that they're good at acting, but they're better at being. They can give themselves up to something bigger or higher than themselves. And there isn't anything bigger or more higher than themselves than love. It's a male thing. We males tend to be like that. Males, you know, think of what is it that you that, that is kind of the most uh, symbolic or the, or the most essence of ego, right? It's me. It's about me, what I want, what I need. Well, men will give up their lives to their country. Well, what's, you know, what's giving up ego more than giving up your life? Men, most men that I know, 
would easily give up their life, give up their being, give up their ego to protect their woman and to protect their children. Jeez, men even will give up their ego and put themselves at risk, you know, to fight each other in a bar, you know. Men will drive their motorcycles at 130 mile an hour just because it's fun. Well, why? They might kill themselves. They could be wiped out. Their egos could be destroyed. Yeah, but it's fun, you see. So women won't do that, you see. So men have the capacity to give themselves up, you know, give up their egos. And that's what, of course, death, you give up your ego entirely. They have the capacity, more so than the women, to give themselves up entirely for some ideal or idea that's bigger than they are, like having fun on a motorcycle or protecting one's family. So the guys have to do this because they're most able and capable to do it. On the other hand, on the back end of this, the way it works is that when the man makes his woman the you know, the focus of his life, makes her happiness the focus of his life, his woman is now in such a secure position. She is so well-loved and so secure, her needs are met. She will automatically then want to do what she can to deserve that. She will automatically, because this is the way women are, she will automatically start treating the man in the same way, like he is her reason for being alive. She will try to please him and make him happy. You see, that's what she will naturally want to do. Why does she do that? Because being a female, she is intellectual. She uses her mind and her intellect in the inside world. Inside world is the world of relationship. Women approach relationship with their intellects. That's why they're called conniving and manipulating and so on is because they're thinking about relationships. They do things in relationships on purpose because they've thought about it and they've considered the outcomes and they do what they think is best. They will see that this man is giving his all to them and loving them and they will not want to fail to return that because if they do, they're worried that he will wander off someplace else. They need to be worthy of that. So the ladies will very quickly fall in and return the same kind of love to their man. Now, men, the reason men are, get, are good at the front end is because, as we said, you know, uh, the men, they apply their intellect, their rationality in the outside world. The outside world is stuff. The women apply theirs to the inside world of relationship. That's just a fundamental difference between males and females. So in the outside world of stuff, that's why men are able to do the things they do, you know, to give themselves up to higher causes and stuff, because that's all part of the outside world. And the outside world may just call them to do that. And they just go off and do it because they can, because that's where they apply their intellect is there. So the women, on the other hand, when they get out into the outside world, they work with their intuition. They're not really interested in, the, in manipulating it so much. So, you know, the woman doesn't care how the car works, only that it works. You see, don't bore her with the details of how it works. She doesn't need to know that. You know, she doesn't want all that intellectual process in the outside world. She just wants it to work. So the woman kind of stumbles through the outside world based on her intuition and feelings. But she's aware and intellectually tight and focused on the inside world of relationship. The man's just the opposite. The man has his intellect focused on the outside world and all those things, and he wants to control those and manipulate those and make them be the way he wants them to be for him and his family. And he stumbles through the inside world. He stumbles through the world of relationships based on his intuition and his feelings. His brain isn't connected at the inside world, you see. Her brain isn't that connected in the outside world. So what happens is that men have this idea that they look at things from the outside view, not from the inside view. So they think women are kind of just, they're intuitive. They don't make a lot of sense. They're emotional. Uh, they, never, they don't seem to understand things in depth. Well, that's because from the outside view, that's a male's view. 
because women relate that sort of way to the outside world. Whereas women see men in terms of relationship as men. You know, they can be manipulated. They can be turned this way and that. You can make them, you know, whatever. The women are obviously in charge. The men don't have a clue. You know, they can't remember your birthday. They don't know what's going on. They just stumble their way through on feeling and intuition inside, you know, in the relationship world. So both men and women have their own you know, worlds that they live in, their own ways of interpreting data, their own ways of seeing things. And that's the origin of the men are from Mars and lady are from Venus thing. They don't interpret data the same way. Different things are important to them, you see? So that's the difference. Now, so the men on the front end have the capacity to be loving, to love their wives in that way and just say, okay, it's been need-based. It's all about me and what I want. But I see this thing as the right way to go. It's really better for a love-based relationship. And I'm the leader here. And this all is taking place in the outside world. That's, that's my place where you know I do things and I can do this. They can do that sort of thing. If the women were to start and lead and be the one that started with the, you know, if whatever the man wants is right, and the women's just are supposed to make him happy, well, the women would have a hard time with that because that's a relationship thing to them, and they would be constantly intellectualizing, second-guessing it. Well, how is this doing? How is he reacting to that? Is this going to work? Am I doing this right? And they'd have their intellect constantly picking at that issue. They would be analyzing it and judging it as they go. The men inside the relationship it's just in, intuition and feeling. You know, they can, they can blunder through things very easily without their intellect getting in the way. So that's why they're in the front end. And the men on the back end, if the woman gave the man everything he wanted, tried to just make him happy, most of the men would just kick back and say, oh, this is good. Keep it up, baby. They wouldn't necessarily feel the need to then repeat that and give that back to the woman. They'd think this is part of the outside. This is just the way she is. If she want to make me happy, well, I'm happy. I have a great wife here, but they wouldn't necessarily feel that they needed to change to deserve that. They figure, well, I must deserve it if I'm getting it. You see, because they don't intellectually process at the relationship mode. So it's the woman that has that will naturally, most women will, very quickly feel like they need to emulate that same behavior. They can give that now because they feel secure enough. Before they couldn't give that just love, whatever he wanted to make him happy because they weren't that secure. Because it really wasn't about love, it was about needs. And they feel like maybe they'd just be abused if they did that. So they'd have that problem. So you get the male doing what the males do best, you get the women doing what the women do best, what comes natural to them, what's primal in the male-female part. And <clears throat> that will eventually work into a relationship where both people are trying to make the other one as happy as they can make it. Where each of them, their, their life's goal is to make their spouse happy, to give them what they need and what they want, you see? And what could be better than that? It's not need-based anymore. It's not, I'm doing this because it's a contract and this is expected of me and this is the way I have to act. But I'm doing this because I want to. I love it. It's fun. I can make you happy. I can make you smile. I make you feel good that you're with me. You see, now the two people are in the relationship, not because they have a contract, but because they want to be. Because their relationship is fantastic. Because it's love-based. It's a beautiful relationship. And that relationship, that won't deteriorate. Once they get that, that tends to persist because it's, it's, uh, it's good. It's positive feedback. It continues that way. In other words, it gets in a positive spiral. If the man is trying to please the woman, as you su suggest that he does, which is a very lovely concept, the woman will eventually then want to respond in the same way and so mm. he won't necessarily be deprived of his golf or his fishing trips no. or his football that will simply work as a result of the love that he exactly. is exactly you see okay. once his wife 
has the security to open herself up like that, she'll see that as being very vulnerable if she had to do it first and on her own. Guy doesn't see it as being vulnerable, you see. She would. But when she's safe enough and she realizes she needs to return that, she needs to be worthy of that because she's an intellectual about relationship and that makes sense. If she just lays back, she's going to throw something away. This guy isn't going to do this forever, you know. This sort of thing's the way she feels. So, yes. What about his golf and his fishing and, and his football? If football is what he likes and football is what would make him happy, she'll want him to do the football. If he does the football and it makes him happy, that will make her happy. Because what makes her happy is that he's happy, you see? And if instead of football, she'd rather go visit her mother or <clears throat> you know her sister or do something else, he'll want to go with her to visit her mother or her sister or do something else rather than football because you know, football's just about him and it's all about her. You see how this works? Yes. So everybody gets what they want. Everybody, everybody wins. It's a win-win. Only when you think of it, but will I, will I still be able to do what I want to do? That's fear talking. That's just ego talking. But what if... What if I get taken advantage of? And what if they, you know, don't, don't reciprocate? That's fear talking. Be love and see what happens. Now, if you end up with a spouse that just doesn't have the capacity to love, and like I say, some people are like that. Well, there's two options you have then. One, you can say, it doesn't really matter. I'm loving. I enjoy loving. I make her happy and she's pleased as she can be. And I like that. I like it when she smiles. I like it when I can give her what she wants. And you can live your life perfectly pleased at your giving because giving is where the real pleasure comes from, not the getting. We think the getting is where our fun comes from, is where pleasure comes from. It doesn't. Whatever you get, you want more. You know, it's like how much, how much money can you need before you don't want any more? Ah, there's no amount. You always want more and more and more. And if somebody gives you this, well, you want more. Oh, rub my back. Oh, that felt really good. You always want more. Whatever you get, it wants more. So there is no end to that. That's why people who are rich aren't necessarily happy because getting more doesn't make you happy. What makes you happy? Giving, making somebody else smile, making somebody else's life as perfect as you can make it. Just knowing that you are Pleasing that person is pleasing to you. Their smile is your smile, you see. That you're giving them what they want makes you happy. So that's one possibility. Just love. If it doesn't come back, so what? It's not about you. It doesn't have to come back. It's about you giving, not about you getting. And if you say, oh, that's not for me. I got to get. Well, that's just your fear and your ego worried about you. It has nothing to do with love. The second possibility is that if that other not only can't love, but also is abusive to where they start seeing you as their personal slave now that you're willing to make them happy. Oh, you will hop up and down on one foot in the corner if I tell you to, then hop up and down, you know, uh, in that corner. Stand on your head, you know. Go uh, clean all the toilets with your tongue, you know. You get somebody that's just abusive just because they feel power. Well, you don't need to stay in an abusive relationship. Leave. Go find someone else to live your life with. If they get abusive, it's not for you. They don't have the capacity to be someone that you can really love with. So you don't love and get abused. So those are, you know, that's another possibility. There's a high probability, probably a 95% probability that each will end up loving the other just like they love, you know, each other. That if he starts and he leads, she will follow and be trying to make him as happy as she can make him. It's about a 95% chance that that'll work. I've, I've inst instructed, I've talked about to other people, maybe a half a dozen people who've tried this, all of them, it works just like that. It ends up with a love, love, win-win relationship. So I'd say that's a very high probability. Now on the, on the 3% or 5% that that doesn't work, I'd say most of that would probably still work if 
you just love. One person can love in a relationship and let the other person just be however they are. Maybe they're not grown enough, but by giving them that security, you optimize the probability that they will grow. It may take them a year or two or three, but the probability that they will grow and start loving you and making you as happy as they can is much, much higher than in any other circumstance. In other words, you're optimizing their environment for them to learn how to love. You're making it easy for them to learn how to love. And almost always, they will. But you may have to give it a little time. It doesn't happen just like that. When you first start this, the ladies are thinking, is this, is this guy for real? You know, he suddenly started trying to please me and I think it's just an act. Well, she has to learn, and it may take six months before she gets the idea. This is not an act. He really means it. This is sincere. And if it's not sincere, it won't work. So mostly it's going to work really great. If it doesn't, and you're in that 2%, then just let it be you. Just love and give. You will find that your life is happier. You are more satisfied in that relationship where you're the one giving than you were in the relationship where it was a, a deal, where it was a contract. You're still better off, even if it's just singular, just you doing all the giving. It's still better, much better than the old, I'll do this if you do that relationship. So it's a long shot that it'll turn out badly, that your spouse is so incapable of loving and growing that she becomes or he becomes abusive. That's unlikely. If it is, they don't have enough quality for you to be wasting your time there. You need to find somebody with more quality. So that's, you know, that's an unfortunate, sad thing, but that happens, you know, and you have to deal with that. But that's the, you know, that's the one half a percent. Not like the divorce rate is now of, you know, 60% or 70%. So you're really better off. Your odds are much better. You'll end up in a better situation, guys, if you can just do this. Put that woman of yours on a pedestal and make her happy, whatever it takes. Do whatever she wants. If you see her and she looks tired, then offer to carry her briefcase. Offer to take her wherever she wants to go. Maybe she needs a little vacation. Maybe she needs that, this or that. Just think about her. It's about her. She's your reason for existing. Making her happy is why you're alive. Just get that in your mind and you'll see that your life will get better and better and better. All the things that you really want in your needs will get met, not because somebody is grudgingly filling their part of the contract, but because somebody really wants to make you happy. You see, mm -hmm. it's an entirely different viewpoint and it's the only way that you can take a need-based contract, sort of contract-based love and turn it into a contract-based relationship and turn it into a love-based relationship. That has to happen. Just going to a counselor so that you can renegotiate the contract just puts you in the same old space. A year later, it's the same thing all over again because the people aren't changing. They're just trying to change the contract, but the people remain the same. That isn't going to do anything. So if you want to optimize your relationship, this is, a, this is a process to go through. It lets the men do what the men do best. They're leading the process. They have to lead it. They have to start off and make it work. The women will come along up behind them, learn the same thing, and give right back to them what they're giving to their women. And it will end up making a really, really good relationship. And if it only turns out a giving of one, the other one doesn't do that, it's still better, much better. And if it ends up that the one's abusive, well, you probably should have gotten out of that relationship a long time ago. You've probably been wasting your time for years if that's the kind of relationship it is, that it's just abusive. Well, I think that's good so, advice. So it works out for everybody, you see. No matter how it ends up, whether you're in the 95% or the one half percent or whatever, it's all better. If you leave someone who's abusive, that's better. If you learn to love and give and it's unilateral, that's better. If it's bilateral, that's wonderful. They're all good. And what's the only thing that's not good is if you remain in that same old need-based, 
contract-based relationship of I'll do yours if you do mine. I promise that I'll do part of the housework and I'll do this and that, but, you know, I want to smoke cigars and watch football on Saturdays. Okay? She says, okay, but I want to go shopping on Sundays and, you know, and you work out this kind of almost grudging relationship where you meet each other's needs with the minimum amount of rancor and that passes as getting by and that's about as good as it gets in a contract-based relationship, you see, and that's not very good. Compared to what you have otherwise, that's nothing, you know, that's awful. So you've got everything to win, everything to gain, and really nothing to lose. It's a good thing, but the guys have to lead, and uh, they have to start off, and they have to not pretend it can't be an act, it's got to be real. I mean, they really have to feel that their woman is worth any effort, Anything that they can do, if they can possibly do it, you know, if it's within their means, if they have the time, the money, and whatever, then the inclination is not a problem. The inclination is there. Maybe time and money says, well, I'm sorry, I can't do this right now. But, you know, I'm also talking about the fat part of the curve. Now, there are those females who use their intellect on the outside world and anything, you know, like the men do. There are those men who are very sensitive who think about relationship and all that sort of stuff. So we're not, I'm not saying that every woman is just like that and every man is just like that. Male and female gender roles are a continuum from one pole to the other. We're just talking about the majority case here where most of the men kind of end up over on this pole, most of the women end up there. The fact is there are some women over here where the men are in the men's pole. There are some men over there living where the women are in their pole. But those are exceptions, you know, they're at the, three sigma or five sigma level out in the statistics. They're, at the, they're out in the tail of the curve. And for them, just apply it the other way, you know? Mm -hmm. If you happen to be one of those women who compete and arm wrestle in the outside world and stumble your way through relationships, then you maybe need to be the one that takes the leadership role. Particularly if your husband has to be one of those guys who's very relationship oriented and uses his intellect to work in a relationship and he bumbles and stumbles his way through the outside world and just switch those roles. Girls, what you have to do is you have to be honest. You have to tell your man what you need. If you want your room painted mauve, tell him, I really want my room painted mauve. It's important to me. And just because it's important to you, it's important to him for no other reason. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to say because the room has old paint and there's dirt in the corner and it really needs to be painted and I've got all these mauve pillows and you see, oh, that's just justification. doesn't matter. doesn't matter why you want it painted. Just say, I'd really like to have it painted. And that, from his viewpoint, is that needs to be painted because that's something I can do. That's not that hard and it'll make her happy, you see. So girls, you have to be honest. Don't tell him what you think he wants to hear. Tell him the way you feel. On the other hand, you have to give him a chance to succeed. You know, it's not, what I need is a million dollars in the bank. You see, that's not, that's not uh, reasonable. You have to keep it reasonable in a way that he can actually succeed. If you keep giving him things that he can't do, he'll get frustrated, not at you, but at himself, because he can't give you what you want. He'll feel failed as your man that he can't satisfy you. And after all, if he can't satisfy you at all, well, he might as well look for a different relationship where he can satisfy, you see? That's not going to work. He'll start looking elsewhere. So you have to give him targets that he, can, that he can do and maybe even help him do it some. Because after all, remember, he bumbles his way through relationships <laughs> with, his, with his instincts and his uh, intuition and his feelings. So it's not so much that this is what the men have to do and this is what the women have to do. It has to do with more of how you are in these gender roles. But what, 90, 95% of the people are kind of separated in these poles. That's why the men are mostly from Mars. <laughs> See, what we're saying is all men aren't from Mars. Most of the men are from Mars. Yes. All women aren't from Venus, but most of the women are from Venus. You see, but there are a few women who are from Mars and there's a few men that are from Venus. And that's okay, but that's way out in the margins. That's the, you know, 
Like that's probably the half percent, maybe less. Maybe that's the tenth of a percent. That's not many. So everything I'm saying is is uh, not dogmatic. It's just most of the people will find this prescription to uh, to work and make wonderful relationships. And if you don't do it, I think the best you can do is a amicable friends kind of uh, contract. You know, a friendly amicable contract. And that's not bad, but it's not at all like a really love, love relationship. There's a world of difference between them. You know, we've talked about uh, efficiency of the system, and we, we have seen that our roles that are played here um, as a male or female, there's, a, there's an interaction there and our role in this lifetime. Evita made a very interesting comment that we get to play these different roles in, in different lifetimes, and that's to optimize learning as well. This whole system is for optimal learning. Yes, it is. This system is a wonderful system. I mean, a lot of people say, what am I doing here in this ugly world, you know, with all this hate and all this negativity and low uh, quality consciousness? But this is a, a world that really is the fast track for learning. And the larger consciousness system wants you to succeed, wants you to grow up. It actually needs you to succeed, if you will, and grow up because when you decrease your entropy, you're part of it, its entropy automatically decreases because you're it. It's you. You decrease your entropy, you succeed in growing the quality of your consciousness. The whole system now is better off. So it wants you to succeed in lowering your entropy, becoming more spiritual, growing the quality of your consciousness. So it will help you. It will put experiences in your way so that you notice the bigger picture. It will nudge you to do things that give you more opportunity. So as long as you just try, you'll find the system will bend over backwards to help you succeed. It's not like we're in a mean system. The only meanness here is our own. It's not the systems. There's plenty of meanness here, but that's just low quality, fear-based, need, belief, expectations, and ego. That's where all the meanness is. The system isn't mean. The system is loving. The system wants us to succeed. So if you just try a little bit, you'll find that it's easier than you think. Yes, it's a very efficient system. Here the system sees, here's two people that are really trying to change their relationship from a contract to love. The system will kind of help them. They'll nudge that. Things will work out just right. It'll, you know, it'll work out good. The system will tell the lady, you know, you you need to reciprocate on it. You need to grow up here too. Look how your man's grown up. And, uh, you know, it'll tell him the same sort of thing. She's your woman. Give her what she wants. It'll be nudging these people to make it succeed because it wants them to succeed. But if they don't try, if they're not serious, the system won't bother with them because there's no point. It's not going to waste its energy where it won't work. So you really have to be serious and try. But if you do, you'll get all the help that you can need. All the help that you can use, I'll put it that way, not all the help that necessarily you need, but all the help that you can use, you'll get. And by the system, of course, you mean what, as we've said before, some people think of this system as God, yeah. and that's... Um, that's okay. You know, it's the larger it's, consciousness system. Yes. And the larger consciousness system is just a natural, evolving system. It's an information system. It is not perfect. Living being. It is, it's, yeah, you can call it a living being. It's not perfect. It's not infinite. It's a finite, imperfect system that's trying to survive and maintain its existence through lowering its entropy. And we are pieces of it. So you put it, you know, if you put it like that, it sounds very much like the natural world. But you can also put it into this larger consciousness system is God. Well, in a lot of ways, it fits that bill. Now, God would be thought of as infinite and perfect and all these things, and the system is an infinite and perfect, but that's mostly dogma. That's not essential stuff about God being infinite and perfect. What's the essential stuff about God is that uh, it's, uh, like, you know, it helps the people. You help, you know, helps those who help themselves, right? Well, check that one off. Mm -hmm. uh, more or less omniscient, knows what's going on. Yeah, well, check that one off. Um, is the, is the uh, kind of 
the source of all creation. Yeah, check that one off. We're all one with the creator. Yes, check that one off. You see, there's a whole lot of things that sound very much like religions, both Eastern and Western. You know, God is love. Yeah, check that one off. You see, a lot of those things make the larger consciousness system the fundamental stuff that theology is all about. So you take your fundamental questions or your fundamental attributes of God, you know, that the theologian would talk about, and almost all of those attributes are present in the larger consciousness system, all the important stuff. Now you take all the dogma and the creed and the ritual, none of that is present. This is just a natural system. There's no dogma. There's no creeds. You don't get any points whatsoever for believing anything. It has nothing to do with belief. It's, it's none of that. But all the fundamental things that, uh, not, the, not the dogma and not the ritual, but all the fundamental stuff, the larger consciousness system supplies that stuff. It's really what the Buddha is talking about when he said, we're all one. We're all in this together. We're all one. It's one big thing. Well, it is. We are pieces of that consciousness. It's all one.